Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to a special uh, Latter Gay Stories and Mormon Stories broadcast. We are excited to be able to uh, join together with the two platforms to discuss a very important topic, uh, and that is that of President Dallin H. Oaks' recent visit to the University of Virginia. If you followed uh, the news and the latest happenings in Mormondom, you will be familiar with his recent visit to the University of Virginia's law school, where he uh, spoke on two different fronts. One was a earlier meeting with the uh, lawyers at the university, potential lawyer, lawyer students, uh, law students at the University of Virginia, uh, and did a little Q&A, which is part of what we will be discussing in this special uh, live broadcast. And then a second Rotunda uh, 2021 Joseph Smith lecture uh, there at the University of Virginia campus. So for those of you who are joining us and seeing some fresh new faces on the Mormon Stories channel, uh, you will also, for our Latter Gay Stories audience, see some fresh new faces on this channel as well as we're uh, collaborating our efforts in this specific episode with the Mormon Stories audience. And we have some great guests uh, who are lined up today to discuss a little bit more about this topic. What we really want to do is try to understand, for those of you who have been following this, um, the recent news as of Friday of last week, we want to try to better understand exactly where Dallin H. Oaks was uh, when he said things weren't happening at BYU, in particular at that Q&A uh, meeting with the attorneys um, earlier in the day in his visit at the University of Virginia, he had a quote that said um, that BYU had abandoned the practice of electroshock therapy prior to him uh, taking over as president of BYU. So we want to talk a little bit about that. We want to discuss uh, the reality of the situation in the 1970s, uh, particularly what was going on uh, within uh, LDS Mormondom um, and LG perhaps we could say at the intersection of sexuality and reality at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. What was happening at BYU within the church in the 1970s, uh, specifically when Dallin H. Oaks took over as president of BYU? So we brought in um, what I th want to consider some of the big guns, uh, Connell O'Donovan, a uh, LGBT LGBTQ LDS researcher, who has studied this topic, who is uh, well-versed in what's going on um, in, in this space. So we want to discuss that with him. We also want to talk about who Dallin H. Oaks is for um, many people who are, are tuned directly into the Mormon Stories audience. We want to kind of give an idea and, and also to the, the, the Mormon audience, a better understanding of who Dallin H. Oaks was. Why was he chosen as uh, the president of BYU. What qualifications did he bring into uh, the university? What qualifications has he brought into the first presidency? And why, uh, of all topics, he has really honed in on the LGBTQ discussion? So with that, I want to welcome all of uh, this group to the Latter Gay Stories podcast, Mormon Stories podcast uh, collaborative effort. Uh, First, we'll just kind of go around the horn here. Gerardo uh, with Mormon Stories also, I'll let you kind of do a little bit of an introduction, but Gerardo has become a really great friend of mine. Um, also another uh, former gay Mormon, I guess, which is the former? Um, if we're discussing <laughs> I'm still, I'm still conversion therapy, on record. If we're discussing, uh, discussing conversion and reparative ther therapy, I guess you're not a former gay member. Um, so we'll, uh, we have uh, Gerardo uh, with us and then also Connell L. Donovan. But Gerardo, tells, tell the audience a little bit more about you and, uh, and why we're together on this space. Uh, yeah, I just want to be really quick. I, 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 um, so I grew up in Mexico as a member of the church and I knew I was uh, gay from a very young age. And then when my parents found out that I was gay, uh they were referred or found about evergreen so i went through a co conversion therapy program for around about a year uh david matheson who was one of the most recognized and known conversion therapists in utah was uh, my therapist um and then i went on, on my mission and after that, I went to BYU Idaho, where um, I met my current husband and lost my faith in Mormonism. So, 
Um, I'm very passionate about this topic, about conversion therapy. Uh, one of the things that actually, probably one of the first things that I found out that was very shocking and, and really pile into like my loss of faith was finding out about electroshock therapy happening at BYU. Um, so yeah, this is a topic that, um, that I, I'm really interested in. As a side note, make sure we show Gerardo's shirt. This is oh, our yes. letter gay stories, love, <laughs> not musket shirt. Yep. Gerardo owns the same shirt that elder Jeffrey R. R. Holland owns. <laughs> and where, where can you get it, Kyle? Uh, you can get that on the Latter Gay Stories website, lattergaystories.org. And uh, describe, just it, scroll down describe, it our, describe it for our listeners, basically. Yeah, so this is a, this is a 1940s era uh, Nazi Germany painting that was modified. Uh, this is, the painting is called Jesus Breaks the Musket. And uh, it was painted during Nazi Germany time, Christians supporting the Jews, uh, letting them know that even Christ would break the Nazi muskets. After Holland's recent speech at BYU, um, we asked for a license and allowed um, to print the shirt uh, with a little bit of flair to it. So we added the rainbow color to it. And it is our love, not musket t-shirt that's uh, currently always selling out. We, we can only reprint every now and then. So thank you. You should come model for us. That's awesome, Gerardo. <laughs> yeah, I love the t-shirt. All right. So that was a complete um, uh, direct uh, drive in the wrong direction. But thanks, Connell, for sitting through that. We want to welcome to uh, the podcast as well, Connell O'Donovan. Now, Connell, um, I, I mentioned it earlier, you're a researcher and historian um, in all things LDS and LGBTQ. But you work for uh, UC Santa Cruz as well and authored a number of books which have a wide amount of interest uh, in this space, books and articles specific to the LG LGBTQ LDS uh, world, but also um, African Amer American Latter-day Saints. You've um, also done a ton of work in LGBTQ uh, archaeology and uh, anthropology. So welcome to the podcasts. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Connell. And um, yeah, let, let's go from there first. Can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. All right. Uh, first of all, I have not written any books. So th uh, that's incorrect. Lots of articles, though. Uh, and I no longer do general LDS history at all. I, after the November 2015 policy, I quit doing any kind of Mormon story, history, etc., other than LGBT focused. Um, I went on a mission to Brazil, got married, came out of the closet in 85, and then uh, left the Mormon church in the late 80s. So I've I've been non-Mormon longer than I've been Mormon. <laughs> um, I'm a professional genealogist and historian. And uh, I just, I love doing uh, queer history. Which is exactly why we love having you here on uh, this specific uh, channel and this specific topic. So let's jump into a, uh, jump into the topic at hand. Let's first kind of dissect a little bit about uh, Dallin H. Oaks. We, we kind of laid out the, the plan um, and, and kind of showed you why we got to this point. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in, um, in this uh, discussion is going to come from correlated uh, history, come from um, experiences of people who were uh, directly impacted by electroshock therapy. And as uh, we just popped up that slide there a little bit, We've detailed, I know Connell has done an incredible amount of work in this space in terms of, of um, understanding the LDS Church's messaging. I, too, have compiled that as a closeted young gay kid growing up in Mormonism, trying to understand who and what he was. Uh, the On the Record project was the accumulation of, of all the things that I had of. Uh, put together and accumulated and read as a closeted gay Latter-day Saint trying to better understand me. And I will, um, with as much praise as possible, um, let you know how many fingerprints um, of Connell O'Donovan's are found within On the Record. He has done an incredible amount of work in this space, um, just researching and finding things. And, and we're gonna discuss that a little further. So a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today 
are found in on the record, and we will refer back to that uh, many, many times because it really is the church's um, messaging directly from their lips um, or their periodicals in this space uh, in LGBTQ Mormonism. So we'll we'll discuss a little a little bit about that, but. Uh, before Yelling. we go further, could, sure. could you show that previous slide? That's the three photos of me. The, so the center one that says I'm adult survivor of conversion therapy. I went through uh, hypnotherapy at the University of Utah in, I want to say, 1989. I can't remember exactly. Uh, and that was the single most devastating experience of my life and continues to have a profound effect on uh, my personal life, uh, my, <laughs> my romantic life, my sexual life. It, it was really, really destructive. Uh, it was through the, the counseling center there with uh, Dr. Randy Hyde, who uh, he, he was an intern there at the U of U and then uh, moved on to uh, Utah County and, and was an administ a highfalutin uh, mental health administrator there in Utah County, and he did that on my back. You know, he got he got his credentials by torturing me. So I, I hope you're proud, Randy. And I just want to go back to that first picture in the slide. Who is that guy? <laughs> uh, that's me t trying to be Butch. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, I lived in Santa Cruz, California for 20 years. And that's, that's actually Christmas morning. <laughs> One day I went and right at sunrise and had some photos taken. Well, and, and we thank you, uh, Connell, for sharing that portion of, of that experience. And I think that's probably why a topic like conversion therapy and electroshock therapy is, um, is uh, having this type of a discussion is so necessary because it really shows um, the real lived and real world experience of, of how religious organizations and in, in this discussion, particularly Mormonism, impacted the very real lives of men and women uh, who were impacted by this topic. Yeah. Yesterday, we had this discussion um, about Oaks. Uh, on Mormon Stories, we did a four hour deep dive into Oaks's um, visit to the University of Virginia. And maybe Gerardo, you want to just take us through just a two or three minute uh, recap of what we discussed yesterday to bring those who are just following in on today's broadcast up to speed as to uh, what we discussed and and kind of how we unpacked yesterday's um, second portion of Oaks's roundtable uh, uh, lecture at the University of Virginia. Yeah. So uh, yesterday we explored, like like you said, uh, I think several questions. Uh, we explore. We we kind of answered some questions as to like why Elder Oaks decided to go to the University of Virginia, why he chose that specifically that university, um, and we really did a deep dive into his actual talk, uh, the public speech that he gave uh, regarding religious freedom and um, non discrimination, and. Uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk uh, uh, about his talk uh, and his speech. Um, I, I've seen people from both sides, some people like Jana Reese saying like there was nothing new about this speech. And some uh, even LGBT people who I, I've seen uh, were really surprised and even maybe um, happy that that Elder Oaks was in some way reversing course into like what, what what he has said in the past, what he has done in the past. Um, so we, I think we, we all gave really good insight, our own insights into um, what we thought about Elder Oaks, what his intentions were. Um, it was really good to have uh, two law students who were, who are also queer, um, who gave their inputs. And then we also had, um, Joe Baxter, who is currently an attorney who is uh, in the lawsuit that is challenging uh, the exemptions that allow schools like BYU to discriminate against LGBT students. So it was a, a really good conversation. All right. The thing I wanted to also just kind of discuss just for uh, kind of what I brought up earlier as we started this episode, who is this Dallin H. Oaks? Um, for those 
and I know if you have spent time in Mormonism, the name Dallin H. Oaks is super familiar. Um, but I wanted to give a little bit of a background as to who he was, what he did, why he got to where he was at. Um, he was a 25 year old, uh, lawyer who, who graduated with a degree from the University of Chicago School of Law. So a really young, bright, intelligent young man who clerked um, after his graduation for uh, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren. Uh, he spent most of his time in Chicago up until um, he ended up becoming a professor at the University of Chicago just a few years after his graduation. I think it was only like three years after his graduation from the University of, of Chicago. And then um, in 1968, it was an interesting um, uh, newfound piece of information that I didn't really realize, but he became the, um, the on the a founding member of the editorial board of Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, which I thought was super interesting that I didn't know that portion of uh, President Oaks. He was a typical Latter-day Saint with uh, a lot of uh, callings, I would say normal callings within Mormonism. He was an elders corn president, uh, served in state callings. He was a stake uh, a missionary, uh, and then also um, eventually an advisor to the Quorum of the Twelve, and then uh, an apostle. But he, uh, during the time of his uh, opportunities where he would advise the Quorum of the Twelve and work directly with members of the church, he became um, good and fast friends with people like Ernest Wilkinson, uh, Marky Peterson, Spencer Kimball, LeGrand Richards. And ironically, um, he would eventually replace one of those um, apostles as uh, they passed away and a vacancy became available in the Quorum of the Twelve. But in 1971, um, President Oaks became the president of BYU at the resignation of uh, Ernest Wilkinson. He served as president of BYU until 1980. And then um, in 70, um, oh, also, yeah, uh, until 1980. But uh, in 1979 to 1984, this was another little tidbit that I didn't know about President Oaks as he did um, serve as the chairman of the board for PBS, the public broadcasting system. And then eventually after um, that service and service um, from, uh, within uh, a Utah State Supreme Court, uh, as a Utah State Supreme Court justice, he eventually became uh, an apostle in 1984. He left being a Supreme Court justice from the state of Utah to go into the apostleship. One, one thing that um, I think is interesting, if you want a little tidbit of Mormon history, currently the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is uh, Russell M. Nelson. Uh, at the death, um, upon the death of Marky Peterson and Legrand Richards, two apostles were called. But because Dallin H. Oaks was uh, a member of the Utah State Supreme Court, he hadn't yet put away all of his obligations with the Supreme Court. So um, Russell M. Nelson was called first and sustained first. So that's why he is called currently the president of the church. And then uh, a couple months later, Dallin H. Oaks was finally, he was called, uh, but not set apart. So he took a, a position behind President uh, Nelson. Had Dallin H. Oaks not been um, a member of the Supreme Court, Utah Supreme Court, he likely would be the current prophet of the, of the church today, ahead of Russell M. Nelson. Just thought that was an interesting tidbit. So um, gentlemen, is there anything that we left out that you knew about Elder Oaks or maybe some some interesting stories that uh, that you're familiar with, or did I leave, leave anything else out? Um, I, I I did I did just wanted to point out that um, every um, historian or researcher that I I've seen uh, I read I'll give you an example like Greg Prince and even papers from BYU that discuss the intersection of LGBTQ. Um, um, LGBTQ rights and religious freedom, they are always mentioning Dowling A. Chokes as being part of the architect of uh, how the church was going to respond to, um, you know, to the social uh, changes that were happening that were more accepting towards homosexuals. Uh, so it, it is a topic that Elder Oaks has been really involved in and that he constantly is talking about whenever you see Dallin H. Oaks talking about religious freedom, he'll probably be mentioning LGBT uh, issues in, in that talk too, because that's usually what, what his, uh, his main 
uh, expertise. I, I I don't know if expertise because he even said on the Q and A that there were there's a lot of areas on on the law that he's interested in. But as he became the apostle, religious freedom became his main focus, uh, specifically towards uh, what it means for um, homosexuals and LGBT rights. Yeah, and I think the important part of this discussion today is that we are going to um, dissect not only the the messages of of Oaks throughout this time, but I also want to really lay out a good historical uh, or chronological uh, pathway so we can understand the dates and the times and how each person kind of filled in, and then also where he was serving in in a particular point, whether it's ecumenical um, or within the public service as he was. Uh, belaying or re relaying some of these messages. So um, let's start with uh, the University of Virginia Law School. Let's go to his Q&A because um, it was there that he said this monumental message and, and we, can, uh, we can listen to it and understand what um, Oaks was saying directly from Oaks. He was given a question from a student and we discussed this yesterday in um, the uh, first part of this broadcast, discussed um, a little bit about the student who was asking but the video that we have here does have, it is transcribed. So you, if you can't hear it very well, you can read it on the screen. Let's listen to, in this Q&A, what uh, President Oaks was asked and then his response to that. And what have you done to address some of the things that you've done in the past, including the things that you said and overseeing the enforcement of a lot your job and abominating conversion therapy for LGBT students at the let me say about electric shock treatments at BYU, when I became president of BYU, that had been discontinued earlier and it never went on under my administration. Put that to one side. And what if you... All right, Connell, initial uh, reactions. Uh, I, I, I want to scream. Uh, I'm a nonviolent person, but it makes me want to slug him, honestly. He knew, he, I, I know he knew what was going on. And, and, and even if he didn't know, as the president of the, the, the university at that time, literally the buck stops at him and he should take responsibility for that. And, and, but then, but to not do that, to, to, to take this, all, the, all these horrific things that were done to queer students on campus, and, uh, and then to say, that didn't happen under my administration. By the time I got there, it was gone. Uh, that, the, that just compounds the horror of it all. And it just makes me so angry. I, I, I just, I can barely speak. I think so many in this audience will understand exactly what you're talking about and those same emotions and feelings. Let's, before we jump into um, kind of dissecting this, let's talk f just for a second about the optics of this whole situation. We have um, a, a member of the first presidency uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the next in line uh, as prophet president of the church, who is um, in this Q&A. So first, maybe the, the question is, obviously this was, this whole experience in in messaging is, is terrible optics for the church. Um, maybe let's just discuss on kind of a round table is this a problem for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to send out people like Dallin H. Oaks unscripted and have them off the cuff make these messages? Uh, and, and does that impact Mormonism for better or for worse? I, I want to just kind of unpack this and see, was this a smart move for Elder Oaks? Is this a, a good move for Mormonism to have their leaders in these Q&A type sessions? Gerardo, uh, Connell, what do you think? Historically speaking, whenever they've had these unscripted moments, they've generally shot themselves in the foot. I, I've seen it over and over and over again, you know, with Hinckley, with Richard G. Scott, 
ver various Mormon leaders who, w when they're not carefully scripted, when they don't have the teleprompter telling them exactly what to say, and they're just going off the cuff, they often say these things that that, that are untrue, honestly, and then they get caught later and then, you know, the, oh, the church spokesperson has no comment or whatever, you know, they, they quickly try to bury it, you know, I, I yeah, that's my input. Gerardo, what do you think? Um, yeah, as you asked the question, I was just remembering a, uh, a Q and A session of, well, Jeffrey Arhan, Arhan, I think had a, I don't know exactly what university, I, th I think it was Harvard, but I'm not sure, where he was asked about Prop 8, and he sp explicitly said that the church didn't spend one single red cent on Prop 8, uh, which we know that's a lie. Um, what I listened to that as a, as a missionary uh, when I was on my mission, and I didn't know a lot about it, but I kind of just went with it. I think it's, it was harder to to prove that the church, you know, because financial dealings in the church are not transparent. So although everybody knows that the church actually did, and, and there's been some evidence that they did, it was kind of harder to prove. But this one, to me, just uh, was just, uh, I don't know, just like different from all the other ones, because it's this one is really, e you can just easily go to Wikipedia and just find part of, part of just, really easily find the dates where electroshock therapy was uh, done at BYU. And uh, we have to thank a lot of that research to Connell. Uh, he'll talk a little bit later about how he uncovered a lot of these things. And I think the important part of uh, for this discussion is, yes, we, uh, we're talking about the big lie in the meat of this discussion. The second part of what Oaks talked about in this uh, Q&A, I think, is equally problematic. And that's where he, um, and I don't know that we have a clip of it. We, we talked about it at length in yesterday's uh, Mormon Stories uh, episode. But where he, and not even essentially, he just blatantly come out and said, um, in terms of messaging, I say one thing to the Mormons and I say another thing in public. And that's just who I am. And that's my responsibility as a member of the first presidency or as a leader in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I think is super problematic when uh, it, it comes to trying to better understand uh, topics just like LGBTQ Mormonism. When you speak, um, okay, perfect. Do we, we do have the audio of that. Let's play that so the audience can listen to this portion. Let me begin to uh, try to answer your question from the Hawaii uh, remarks. Uh, bear in mind that my audience there was an audience of Latter day Saints. Mm -hmm. I have the responsibility when I teach people who follow Latter day Saint doctrine than I have when I speak as a representative of the church on what position the church ought to take in society as a whole. And so uh, I think the, the correct answer to your question, the accurate answer to your question is, uh, number one, I understand uh, better the situation of the church in relating to society now than I did then. Partly by working on a lecture that I'll give tonight. I refer you to that lecture for part of the answer to your question. The other part is asking you to understand that the church has its unique doctrine. It does not try to make rules for all of society, but we do make rules and set limits for our own membership. And they're uh, responsible either to receive that teaching or not. Uh, but don't judge a public or don't judge a private sermon by public issues. All right. So President Oaks has asked, what have you done to make this space better? What have you done um, since 2019 when you didn't have a single nice thing to say about the LGBTQ community to then show up on this campus and uh, begin to make concessions? All right. What do you think? Was that the right response? How, how did you take his response? 
And if you were, if you were his public spokesman or his, his PR guy, uh, are you pulling your hair out at this point? What's left of it, Connell? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> that was mean. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I had a hard time hearing it. So I, I, and I didn't know any of the context of it. So I, I kind of got lost in what he was saying. So uh, two parts, I think the way he answers that, and I, I, we do agree that the audio is really terrible because it was just um, recorded on the fly, but he's, he's responding first saying as a Latter-day Saint, um, I'm going to, as a leader in the church, I'm going to teach one thing to the members and the next thing to um, other members oh. or to the general public. And, and you're just gonna have to be okay with that because I'm, I'm basically saying I need to hold the Mormons responsible for Mormonism. And, and if the message is different to them um, than it is to the general public, then I'm accountable for that, or that's just how, how it works. The other half of that is he says, um, I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to give in on some of the old messaging, but what I'll do is just continue talking about the, the, the subject. Yes, and sir. So that's kind of the general gist gotcha. of what he was saying. I, to me, it's, it's just that that's what a politician does, speaks to their audience, you know. And I, and I get that, but also he shouldn't be a politician, <laughs> you know. If you're yeah. going to say that you're, you know, speaking for God or whatever, or, or just that you have some sort of moral authority, your message should be consistent. Yeah, I understand that. What, let, so let's discuss. I mean, what what does the church benefit? Uh, what does this topic, uh, or how does this topic benefit when a, a message is being hidden or or um, contorted based on the audience? Do, do we really get to the heart of Mormonism? Do we get to the heart of this message? Do we get to the heart of advo advocacy and better understanding if the message is being twisted so much? Um. I, I I think I can speak a little bit a little bit about this. Um, I I I have been pretty open about um, growing up. Uh, while growing up, my dad has has been, ha, had pretty high positions in leadership in the church. Um, he's currently a bishop, and he used to be in stake presidency. But something that I he really taught me was that probably one of the most important uh missions for the church um and that has always stayed with me what is to protect the good name of the church and 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 that's why they hold disciplinary councils and that's why they excommunicate people and that's why they sometimes have to hide things that are not super good that that in i think in his mind that's how he justifies the church not being fully transparent because that's the number one goal is to protect the good name of the church uh, and it's explicitly written on the handbooks uh, for bishops and stake presidents now that those are out and, and easily accessible to the public. Uh, but Elder Oak's statement just speaks to this, speaks to like he, they're trying to portray an image to the outside public about a happy, good, good family, you know, like uh, that go to church on Sundays, you know, they come onto Christ website that are like, teaching you how to be like Jesus, closer to Jesus. And then this messaging that is harder to take, especially for the newer generations or people like us who have experienced the trauma of, of this messaging, they want to keep that inside, indoors, uh, behind closed doors, and and just uh, reserve for, for the members that can take it. Or, or like even Elder Oak says, like, they even can reject it, but we we have to say it to our members. Yeah, and let's let's listen to this again. Um, we have another uh, more leaked audio uh, from a separate meeting when um, Oaks was presented with a very similar situation. And I, I mean, I really want to try to understand: is this just how backdoor Mormonism works? Is this how our church leaders uh, function when um, you go into a private meeting and? and discuss things that you're not going to discuss publicly. And even if that discussion contradicts each other, let's play uh, a second clip. This was a leaked audio that came out of a youth fireside um, in 2017 in, in Kansas. Similar mode, similar tone. I just kind of want to get your reactions to this as well. Oh, 
Oh, we can't hear the audio. Oh, Request sorry. Not to record. Can we play it again? Because if somebody, for example, and this is a, a current example, and by the way, this is uh, the reason why we have that request not to record. Because if somebody records and puts on the internet something that I say, I am not free to speak candidly to a group like this out of my heart because somebody has recorded it and will take it out of context and send it around the world and it will be in my voice and in today's technology they can change the meaning, they can edit it and fix it up so that I appear to be saying something I didn't say. And so we have that announcement before each meeting where general authorities and Area 70 speak, asking that it not be recorded. We don't have that request for general conference because at general conference we record and have a master. So if somebody tampers with what is said at general conference, we've got an instant refutation. We don't have that for what's said at state conference or in the youth meeting. That's the reason why we have decided recently to have that statement read in any meeting where we are present. Now to get back to, to speaking very candidly, one thing that distresses me is to see people classify themselves, often as early as age, as age 12, as being lesbian or bisexual or homosexual. That is a self-defeating characterization because it changes the way people relate to you, it inhibits your growth, and it stands in contrast to saying to a circle of people that love you and will understand, I'm troubled by same gender attraction. All right, now there is a lot to unpack here, and I want to unpack it in two parts. Um, first, I want to unpack this in the messaging side of this, again, this can't look, the optics of this is terrible for Mormonism. Um, but how, so I want to, I want to explore that section of it. And then the second part of it is we don't hear that Dallin H. Oaks over the general conference pulpit. And he kind of explained why, because, well, first off, I think we have a problem because a lot of our audience who is listening now are listening from all around the world. I've seen Sweden and Australia and these countries who are represented uh, in the live chat so unfortunately, as Elder Oaks just spoke of in that clip, uh, his messages get sent all around the world. So we're evidence of that, that this message has now been sent all around the world. But we didn't distort the voice. We didn't change it to make it sound like he's saying something different. So I, I want to discuss this a little bit. Is this problematic again for the church to have an apostle who was recorded without his knowledge saying things that he would never say over a general conference pulpit. He would never say in public. Um, in fact, he's, he's said at times the the, uh, something completely contrary. So, um, Gerardo, Donovan, uh, uh, Connell, what, what do you, initial thoughts or feelings about that particular message? First of all, I mean, I, it's been a long time since I've even looked at this or thought about this, but I know there's been a study done about general conference speeches and how they get edited and changed. And I know there have been instances where um, multiple versions of what a talk has been have been released by the church after they've edited and re-edited, and they don't match up with the audio-video talk that was given, and in some instances, they've even gone to the extreme of having general authorities re-record their talks as though they're speaking at general conference, but they're actually in the empty tabernacle or whatever, giving a now approved <laughs> version of the talk that they had given previously that the church didn't want out. So, I mean, that's, this whole thing is just, it's a mess. Well, I think you bring up a great point because in 1976, uh, we all are familiar with Boy K. Packer's uh, To Young Men Only talk, the great uh, little factory talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this I, is where, I, yeah. I, I, I think I, I remember being present. I think I was sitting up next to the organ because they have overflow seats up, 
near the choir, uh, and it was a priesthood meeting, and I was a, a, a deacon, and <laughs> you were scared out of your mind. I, I didn't understand what he was talking about. <laughs> it was like a little factory. What? <laughs> anyway, sorry. So, case, yeah, case in point, that was that was the uh, priesthood session, 1976. The church was so embarrassed years later after uh, because of Boyd K. Packer's uh, discussion. If you go on the church's website today, the the idea that. Boyd K. Packer even spoke in conference in 1976 is completely gone. Is the talk gone? is gone. It's been completely deleted. He he appears as if he was never even in the building in uh, October of 1976. I think it was October of 1976 yeah. in that general conference meeting. The the church has completely wiped and scrubbed it uh, out of its, its existence. There was an even, and I I think I even have in my mission scriptures the to young men only pamphlet that still exists that that came off of that talk. Yep, mm -hmm. I have. I have a copy of it too in my archives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember reading it in Spanish too in Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so uh, I think Connell is just talking about this idea that Elder Oaks was, was saying, right? Like if we say in general conference, we have full control, we don't change things and we have, we can prove what we actually said. If someone says we said something, but like Connell is saying, like they are even on record changing stuff on their talks on general conference um even like deleting some part of part of the video you know like uh the one uh, the one about homosexuality being like from a 70 saying like homosexuality is an addiction no like, this is Hart that's hartman rector that's right. uh turning the hearts talk that was a 22 minute conference talk he was a a general authority he was an apostle 22 minute conference talk that's been whittled down to 11 seven, minutes. A seven. A seven. Uh, Hartman Rector become a, a general. He was an apostle. I don't think so. Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Fact check me. <laughs> yeah. But it, the, it, was, it was whittled down to how long? Uh, 11 minutes. So half, From, half the talk. Wow. And, and he goes, and I've got this in on the record as well. And you can listen to the side by side. You can watch what the church deleted. And uh, uh, as. And according, and then what's been uh, kept in the written version, but just unbelievable. Like uh, this, this isn't completely foreign to the church. This seems to be part of the process, and and that's kind of what I want to try to understand here with Oaks. He 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 says it blatantly in the public with this UVA speech, um, but then we have leaked audio of him doing the same thing, except he then gives examples of the harsh rhetoric that he's going to tell people in private. And I, and I think that's where this becomes so problematic in the, the topic of LGBTQ Mormonism is you're telling these stake and, and ward leaders something uh, that seems so harsh and, and, and difficult for them to, to, un to marry or merge with the general conference speech. Most of the, the most of the, the excommunications, the punishments that come uh, through Mormonism or from Mormonism to people of our community, to the LGBTQ community, is happening at the stake and the ward level. So when you have a general authority, the next in line prophet who are, who's visiting and, and giving these types of messages, I think it becomes pr problematic because that is the way those bishops and stake presidents are going to um, handle their ward and stake um, disciplinary councils because they heard it from a general authority who visited. And I think that's super problematic for Mormonism because the official stance of the church is different. And the you would never get Elder Oaks saying, don't ever come out, don't mire yourself in, in a label like being gay from directly from a, a pulpit. And, it, and maybe even further, not just an Elder Oaks, but what about a President Nelson or, or someone else in the church? I think that just becomes problematic. I don't know. Any other comments, thoughts um, on well, just that secret my, messaging? Uh, my only th thought, uh, just to to end with this, but um, I, I think the main reason why, oh, it, it's super interesting to me that he mentions the non-recording thing in the middle of his response to the question about identifying as LGBT. So he started giving the answer and then, you, if you listen to the whole audio, which you can find on on the record, uh, you'll see that he starts answering the question, and he starts realizing he's starting to get um, a, a little bit harsh on the rhetoric, and so he decides to stop, 
give his message about not being recorded and saying like, please don't record this. And then he goes ahead and talks about like using labels is wrong. And what just something interesting is that what he's saying there uh, directly contradicts what the church says on its website right now on same sex attraction, uh, the, the new website that they have up that says that people, uh, members of the church can identify um, as LGBT without repercussion. Can, can I can I just add one quick thing, Kyle? Yeah, go ahead. This is John. So I think it's really important to contrast uh, his explanation for um, why they shouldn't take too seriously what he said at, at BYU Hawaii with what he says in the public. He's basically saying, we speak one way to our members and another way publicly. When you combine with that, his admission that he doesn't want things privately recorded, it seems like what he's really saying is, we want to be able to speak very candidly, privately to our membership um, in ways that would be perceived as very disturbing to the general public. And so, don't record our private conversations because they're embarrassing and disturbing to us. And then know that when we speak publicly, you won't be hearing what we actually tell members behind closed doors. And so the combination of the clip of him acknowledging that he speaks differently privately than he does publicly with the clip of him saying, uh, don't record this privately, it pretty much shows that they don't want uh, it leaked out publicly what is said behind closed doors because it's embarrassing to the church. It's clear that when they speak to the public, they're trying to manage their brand, manage their image, minimize negative repercussions um, for what they in fact actually teach privately. And so for me, sharing those two audio clips side by side is really, really important. And I think just to add on top of that, this isn't just an Oaks issue either. Uh, in two, I believe it's a 2012 or 13 when Wiki, Mormon WikiLeaks released the uh, closed door apostle meetings, um, President Ballard was caught in that discussion talking about this very topic, LGBTQ uh, discussions. And he said, there's a reason why we use the word same sex attracted. Um, instead of same gender attraction. He's like, clearly we know the difference between the two, but to our membership, the word same sex sounds more derogatory. And when we want to use, when we want to make this topic sound more disgusting, wasn't his word, but I think he says repulsive, I think. repulsive. We're going to use the phrase same sex attracted because we've made that, that correlation that that's more evil and disgusting. So I, I agree with that. I, I think that this is an absolute, this isn't just a optics problem, but this is part of the system um, of of the way this organization is is working and, and laying this out. Great, great thoughts. Any any other last thoughts before we actually jump into electroshock therapy and 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 really the the great big message. The big was this the big lie? Did uh, President Dallin H. Oaks know about electric shock therapy at BYU? Um, prior to, during, or after his tenure as president of of the school. Um, how do we jump in? Maybe let's start with first Connell telling us, um, let's just give a little history, what we know about the electroshock therapy program. Um, what have you studied and learned in your um, just decades of, of research in this space? Well, I, I'll start with the one of the first, first times I attended Affirmation, uh, the support group for LGBT Mormons. And this would have been 87, 88. Um, I had just been asked to be the greeter for the Wasatch chapter of Affirmation. And uh, so I, I, you know, that was, I, I would greet new people who showed up. And I remember a young man, uh, he was older than me, but, but I was in my early 20s. So he's late 20s, early 30s, uh, named David, who showed up at meetings and he would he would always sit in the back of the meeting. He wouldn't really talk to anybody. And then as soon as the meeting was over, he'd leave. And I, I like on this third time that he showed up, I finally approached him. And he literally backed away from me and said, don't come any closer. 
And I said, uh, sure, yeah, what's, what's going on? And he rolled up his shirt sleeves to show the insides of his arms. And they were like angry hamburger, raw meat. And he said, I went through electric shock therapy. I don't recall whether it was at BYU or if he did it with Dr. Card or whatever, but I just, I know that he had gone through electric shock therapy. And as part of that, he had control over how strong the electric shock was to himself. And he had just ripped up his arms with it like i said it looked like just raw hamburger and um and it had been years since he'd been through this and he could not physically touch another human being because of this he could not be around them it, it was so traumatic for him and i just remember thinking well i can't i won't say this on the air but Holy caramba, <laughs> you know, this is, this is disgusting. So I, I, I was really interested in the, the topic, mainly inspired by the trauma that he had gone through. Um, and then also because of my own hypnotherapy that I had been going, had gone through. Uh, so I uh, started, uh, and there were, there were rumors that this study had been done at BYU with Ford, Max Ford McBride. Uh, and I was working at the University of Utah at the time in the admissions office. I was the, the secretary to the director of admissions. And as part of the admissions, we get, uh, well, for, sorry, long story, forget that. Um, I w w went to the library and because I knew it was a, a dissertation. And as part of accreditation as a university, you have to make all your PhD dissertations publicly available for intellectual discussions amongst all scholars. When you fail to provide those dissertations, you lose your accreditation. So I go to Marriott Library, and there's an index, and there in the index, there it is. Uh, Max Ford McBride's 1976 uh, visual stimuli and electric shock therapy. And, but, and then there's a summary, just a one page summary. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, this really does exist. I started to look for a copy of it. It was in the catalog of the University of Utah, but the copy was missing. It had, it had been missing for years. The Library of Congress copy was missing from its shelves. I contacted BYU, their library. It was missing from their shelves. So someone, had, and I'm not saying this is you know one person or it's coordinated, but randomly over the years, people had taken the, the copies that were publicly available off the shelves and gotten rid of them so that no one could see these, the copy. To, to, no one could see the dissertation. Um, and I tried and I tried. Then as a secretary of the admissions office, I, well, I had contacted the psychology department at BYU and had been dismissed. Like, eh, it's out there, go find it. Uh, and, I, and then I, as a secretary, if you've watched MASH, you know that it's Radar O'Reilly who actually runs the entire unit, right? So I was like, ah, I'm the radio, Radar O'Reilly of admissions office, so I need to contact the Radar O'Reilly of the psych department. So I found <laughs> one of the lowly secretaries, this woman, and I talked to her and I said, listen, you need to provide me with a copy of this dissertation 
as soon as possible. I'm going to give you three months. If I don't have a copy of it in three months, I'm going to take it to a lawyer and we're going to start examining your accreditation as a university for not providing this dissertation. And she said, you will have it as soon as I can get a copy. And within three weeks, she had sent me a Xerox copy of this dissertation uh, by Max Ford McBride from August of 76. All right, let's talk a little bit about that, um, because for so many who are probably watching or listening, this is brand new news, um, who this Max Ford, what, what do we know about Max Ford hey, McBride? Hey, hey, Kyle, can I just add one thing? I just want to really establish, this is kind of ham-fisted. President Dallin H. Oaks was president of BYU from 1971 to 1980. Okay, I just want to really make sure everyone understands that those are the years, right. so basically throughout the 70s. And if you just kind of do the math, this dissertation was published in 1976, which means that it would have been approved and run during the time that Dallin H. Oaks was president. I just want to explicitly answer and emphasize the that, that yeah. everybody is asking. I don't think we've made that very clear. So Oaks 71 to 80 dissertation, 1976, smack dab in the middle of Dallin H. Oaks, uh, Dallin H. Oaks's administration. Okay, keep going. So yeah, I just want, before we we have uh, the ability to read a little bit of the introduction of this dissertation, but what do we know about Max, uh, Max Ford McBride? I, he goes by Ford. Um, what do we know about Ford McBride? I don't know. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. I don't. <laughs> Um, I actually, it seems like in my, in the back of my memory, I believe he lives in Provo currently and is still a, a psychologist. Um, but we, let's, uh, let's go to the, um, the study description. Do you want me to talk through it, Kyle, or do you want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and, and talk through that. Well, um, I prepared these slides. You may not know exactly, um, what was prepared. Um, so this, this is, uh, so for those who are listening, um, the the title the title page of the dissertation says effect of visual stimuli in electric aversion therapy, a dissertation presented to the Department of Psychology at Brigham Young University, in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy by Max Ford McBride, August 1976. And then if we read the abstract of I, can this, I inter oh, interject please, here really yeah. quick? So. The, that's a very convoluted academic way of saying we're going to use pornography to see how that affects electric shock therapy when we do this. So that there, these gay men are going to watch straight porn and we'll make them feel good. We'll, you know, there'll be some euphoric stuff going on. And then uh, when they are looking at male nudes, they are going to be shocked so that they associate the shock with male nude bodies. But I just wanted to clarify that that's yeah. what that means. Yeah, you, you just did a great job of explaining aversion therapy, um, which is where you give a negative sort of punishment so that the, the people can associate the negative punishment with whatever the stimulus is. It's a way to try and they, they, it's basically, it comes out of Skinner and Pavlov behavioral psychology, basically look, looked at rats and pigeons and dogs and tried to figure out how to train rats and pigeons and dogs to do uh, desired behavior. And so once Skinner and Pavlov and Skinner kind of helped develop these techniques within the field of psychology, psychologists in the 50s, 60s, and 70s said, hey, let's just apply these types of techniques to humans. And, and that is the spirit of, of these studies. And so if you actually read the abstract, this is going to be slightly repetitive of what you just said, Connell. But um, the description or the abstract of the study says, two experimental groups of seven subjects each received behavior therapy for male homosexuality, which incorporated aversive conditioning and assertion training. So the aversion, aversive conditioning part is the shock therapy. The intent of the study was to determine whether use of nude male and female pictures 
are a necessary requisite for successful treatment. Indices of change included subjective rating of male and female slides used in treatment. Um, ple plethysmographic impact measured by penile volume change to a standard set of male and female slides not used in treatment and a self-report questionnaire that measured sexual orientation. Um, and, and if we actually, we have, we have a video that kind of explains, but really quickly, I'll just, before we go to the video, I'll just read a couple more things from the study, um, just so that we can understand kind of scientifically what they're doing. So according to experimental group assigned, um, they rated, uh, either nude or clothed female and male pictures on a scale from one to 10, a rating of one signified sexual repulsion, repulsion five signified sexual neutrality and nine high sexual attraction. So they basically show nude photos, male and female to the participants and they rate their level of traction, attraction to the photos. This, um, and this is on campus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where pornography Kimball, is not in, allowed. <laughs> probably in the Kimball tower. Right. Or, or may, no, maybe it's in the, in the counseling and psychological services center in the Wilkinson Center. In, in the, yeah. yeah. And so I think just, go ahead. definitely something we should talk about because um, the fair Mormon version of these events specifically say that were, there was no nudity ever used at BYU in these studies, that the idea of pornography being used at BYU is an absolute falsehood. Yeah. True yeah. or false? Uh, so, so they have basically they based that claim on an interview they did uh, with a psychology professor who did electroshock therapy on on gay students at BYU. But the professor says that he was never he, like he did it by himself. Uh, just uh, he recruited students. He recruited people from his own students. People would come to him uh, because of word of mouth. He would not accept people uh, coming from referred from the honor code or ecclesiastical leaders. So, and he says he was not aware of any other uh, electroshock or aversion therapy experiments going on in the seminaries while he was doing this. So, but it the, seems like there was a division between the professor, this professor that Fair Mormon uses as a source, and what was actually happening. Uh, outside, you know, the the professor side. Of the but, the, but this abstract answers that question. It right. says nude male and female pictures. So clearly, clearly, uh, nude, wow. nude female and male pictures are being shown. Yeah, and um, I think I think it's just unbelievably disingenuous for uh, the apologist side of Mormonism to say nothing more than just sport. And in fact, I think they say things like Sports Illustrated. Um, just uh, physical fitness magazines, sports magazines, uh, things like um, yeah. The professor they, they, said that whenever they would, if it was any kind of nudity, it would be art, kind of like uh, like Michelangelo's kind of statues, uh, but nothing else. Yeah. Like, that's what the professor says. But but he also says that nothing else went on, and we know that it did. Yeah, so let's we, go to the let's go to the video. Let's get an understanding from first, or unless you were going to hit. Oh uh, yeah, else. just very quickly. So the the study continues uh, after the slides are rated. A phallometric test was employed to measure. This is from the dissertation. So I'm just giving the technical description from the dissertation. Then we'll show the video to have a human describe. A phallometric test was employed uh, to measure physiolog physiological arousal to male and female stimuli through a VCS tape. Um, that's a cassette, uh, a, a video cassette tape, which uh, Gen Zers won't know what that is. Um, it, it's a precursor to streamed video on Netflix. A brief explanation was given concerning how the apparatus operated and how it should be fitted on the penis. It was then privately fitted by the subject and worn unobtrusively under his clothes. All participants viewed a series of 30 male slides and 30 female slides Subjects in both groups viewed the same slides, which were viewed through a gooky hand slide reviewer. Subjects were instructed to fantasize whatever was sexually arousing using the picture as the main stimulus for fantasy development. Female standard VCS were viewed first, 
male standard VCS were then viewed when there was no measurable arousal shown in the plethysmograph. Plethysmograph. Plethysmograph, thank you. Um, the CER phase was accomplished through the use of respondent procedures. Um, the therapy VCS, 35 millimeter slides of nude males in different poses um, and closed males in uh, poses for a different group was paired with the UCS or the electric shock. Each CER trial was comprised of 30 male therapy VCS individually shown. Subject was instructed and encouraged from time to time to project his typical homosexual fantasies and thoughts to the scenes depicted in each slide. Three CER trials occurred, each section for six to 10 sessions. So we know there were six to 10 sessions. Pain thresholds to shock were established. The procedure was used. The procedure used was similar to the one employed by Epstein and Ropenane in 1970. At the beginning of each session, pain thresholds were set. A graded series of discrete shocks were delivered to each subject at the belly of the bicep. Duration of shock was approximately three seconds with an intertrial uh, inter interval of approximately 10 seconds. The intensity of the first shock was 0.5 MA, and the intensity of each successive shock was increased by 0.5 MA until either the shock was rated as barely tolerable or painful or a maximum level of 4.5 MA was reached. If during the conditioning procedure, the shock level became more tolerable, it was increased in a stepwise manner to avoid habituation. Conversely, if the shock level became intolerable, it was decreased in a stepwise manner. And then finally, the criteria for terminating, criteria for termination of this phase was determined by completion of at least six sessions or reported inability or pronounced difficulty fantasizing to male stimuli, or reported difficulty establishing or maintaining interest in the slides, and reported indifference or repulsion towards the male slides. So keep doing this until you are no longer, um, uh, you know, keep doing this until you report indifference or repulsion to the male slides. We'll keep shocking you until you're repulsed or indifferent to the male slides. These criteria were determined by subjective verbal reports from each subject. Um, so, I mean, and, and then I think just the most important part is to show the consent form that people had to sign. Um, this is the consent form from McBride, 1976. And I'll just read a little bit of it. Um, I, the, the subject, witnessed the fact that I have had explanation to me all of the various ramifications of experimental aversion techniques used to counter condition inappropriate emotional propensities like those of my own. I fully realize that these procedures are experimental in nature of their design and application, and that their application to me will likely produce a great deal of discomfort, and that perhaps, and this is important, tissue or organ damage could result. Nevertheless, I allow to, I agree to allow Dr. Eugene Thorne and his clinical associates to administer these experimental aversive techniques to me in a way that in their judgment would seem appropriate to therapeutic objectives. So, so that, doc, doc, yeah, Dr. Ahead. Thorne was the head of the psych department and Ford McBride was under his supervision. So, okay, I'm just realizing this. And I'm I'm a little bit shocked because no pun intended. It it is uh, <laughs> it is it, it is Doctor Thorne who was interviewed by Fair Mormon, and Doctor Thorne. I was just barely listening to that interview, and Doctor Thorne and the the person ask the 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 person from Fair Mormon asking Doctor Thorne. He he asks him several questions. He asks, do you use pornographic or nudity? And I already said what Dr. Thorne said. And he says, uh, did, you, um, did you place this electroshock therapy in the genitals of, of, of your subjects? And I'm going to confirm this just really quick, but Dr. Th I'm pretty sure it's Dr. Thorne who says, no, that would be outrageous 
that's, that's not the exact word he uses, but he says that, that would be crazy. Right. We, we would put it on their arms, on their, uh, on their, on their legs, but never, never on, on their, on their genitals. So Gerardo, the, the yeah. plethysmograph is a cuff that went over their penis that would measure erections. That that's what this is been talked about. The electric shock did go okay. just to the bicep. Okay. It, it was not, they did not sh shock the genitals of okay. the, okay. That of makes the sense. subjects. And Gerardo, just to your point, here is the signatures of committee approval. And Dr. Eugene Thorne is the committee chair of this study. And he is right there uh, on, you know, his signature is right there. On the I just want to point out dates again. Um, in terms of this discussion, President Oaks said uh, when he took over BYU in 1971, this has already been uh, dismissed, abandoned, disassembled. It did not exist. We have the McBride study from 1976 with the receipts, with the signatures of members who were at BYU at the same time President Oaks was president. Yeah. Yep. All right. Do so you guys want to play the video now? Just no, to go, you need to return to the, the consent form. There was still, didn't, oh. wasn't, there was one last little piece that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, it was just about the pornography that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I'll I agree that, read that some of these, the, the last sentence in the second paragraph, some of okay. these materials could be construed to be socially or morally offensive. I'll mm -hmm. read it. I also witnessed the fact that the visual, auditory, and other sensory modality stimuli used to counter condition my in inappropriate emotional propensities that's loaded language, have been either provided by me or I have agreed to use them as directed by Dr. D. Eugene Thorne and his clinical associates. Some of these materials could be construed to be socially or morally offensive. And I do want to read the last part. Finally, I released Dr. D. Eugene Thorne and his clinical associates from all legal liabilities that could result from treatment provided me from them and from any communication of my case materials to other clinically oriented individuals. So it's making sure there's no liability for any damage that may occur. Yeah. Wow. Unbelievable. I just hadn't made the connection because I was listening to Dr. Thorne who, who uh, on Fair Mormon, I think this was in back, back in 2012. And he's just saying pretty much how everything was so good. Uh, ele electroshock therapy or aversion therapy was with everyone just entered into full consent. They could leave whenever they wanted. No one was harmed. Uh, they asked him specifically if like, if, if, if someone like had any organs or any like part of their skin damaged and he says, no, that would be crazy. Um, so, so it's just, really interesting to actually see um the paperwork that that the, the students or whoever was part of the uh the experiment had to to agreed and i just i will talk about this later but i just don't see how elder oaks can say that this stopped in 1969. i don't see how there's any way that that could be said and now that it if, if it weren't known then it's clearly known now, and I don't know why this wouldn't merit a really public and candid apology, but we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Yeah, let's listen to the firsthand account because I think this really explains in a very concise and precise way of the way this program rolled out. And and not only, not only how the electroshock treatment worked, but the receipts. The location, the times, um, how this all unfolded, and then we'll discuss that after this little clip. And this video comes from Ladder Ladder Gay Stories a YouTube channel. So thank you, Kyle, for helping make all this available. Yeah, and it originally was produced in 1996 under a uh, the title of Legacies, um, and it interviews a handful of men um, who had experiences or understanding of uh, the shock treatment that was happening, the electroshock therapies that was happening. <laughs> Uh, specifically at BYU. And now, here's another true story. I was in my um, junior year at BYU, and um, 
of course you want to do, it was almost like being like an apprentice or learning how to um, um, treat patients. And um, one of the things that we could do, and we, we could volunteer for it, was to do the electroshock therapy for people who wanted to change their uh, sexual orientation. And um, at the time, of course, I knew that I was gay. I had experiences and everything. And I had no desire myself um, to change my, uh, my orientation. However, I thought it was really interesting that there were people who did. And I was very closeted at the time, even though I did have a, a lover at the time, I um, was really closeted. And so um, we did the, um, the therapy, as we referred to it, then in the basement of the Smith Family Living Center on the BYU campus. A lot of times, like BYU security would catch would catch people like in in uh, compromising positions or whatever, and they had the choice of either um, uh, being kicked out of school and their families called and informed about what they had done, or they could undergo this therapy. And so um, we had quite a few people who were going through it, and then there were other people who felt like so much guilt over their sexuality or had been promised that they, if they went underwent this therapy, that, that um, they'd be able to marry and have children and they would just be turned away. Of course, they had to have the desire to change. Therefore, if the therapy failed, then it was always their fault because they didn't have enough desire to change. But anyway, um, they would come in usually three times a week. Um, I would be behind a, 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 a glass one-way mirror, quite a large mirror. I'd be sitting behind there, and um, and they would be on the other side of that. And they we would um, they had the choice they could look at um, pornographic magazines, or um, we would show videos up on the wall, and we would uh, tape um, electrodes uh, to their groin, and uh, about three or four inches down from that on their thigh. Then we would also uh, tape up on their chest. Um, and we taped somewhere else too. I think it was, it was up close to the armpits. And then we had another machine that would um, monitor their, um, their breathing and their heart rate. And what we would do is we would um, let them look at this stuff. And when we, we and, and if they were looking at homosexual pornographic material, we would wait until we could tell a difference in their heart rate. We had a dial that we turned and that would uh, determine the amount of current that would, would go into the shock. And if they were a new patient, then the current would be very low. And we would wait until we, we saw that they were that they were getting aroused and then we would would push a button and the and the, the voltage would go into the wire and from the reaction that i saw them and also the muscle spasms that went on um i'm i'm sure that it was painful and then after we did that then we would then we would um the movies would automatically switch over and we would show uh, uh, a man and a woman um having sex and and we would pay, uh, play very soothing music in the background to try and get the, the, the mind to relate to that. When we got into the higher voltage with the people who had been doing it longer, you could see uh, burn marks on the skin. And quite often, um, you could, they would also um, throw up uh, during the therapy. I mean, this is just speculation, but most of the students there at BYU had never seen any pornography. After undergoing that kind of pain over a period of a couple of months, anybody would um, say, would admit uh, that, that they had, had completely changed. What they did was they kept records for as long as the people were at BYU. And then after they left BYU, there was no records kept to see what kind of, of, um, of su success rate they had had. And so, and, and, and this, statistics from just the BYU, I mean, these people were lying. They were, I mean, they were desperate to get their degree and to get out of that situation. They had been blackmailed into that situation in the first place. We did have some people who became completely asexual after undergoing the, the therapy. But no, we never changed anyone from gay to straight.
This is the way it must happen. This is the way it. Connell, um, your many opportunities to interview people in this uh, space who um, experienced electroshock therapy, how familiar is that account with those of the experiences that you were able to document? Connell, you need to. I, I just. I sorry. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, um, I. So I have a. I just noticed that he. I think said there were electrodes, the shock electrodes on the genitals, and uh, and I do have a hard time believing that. I don't. I I don't think that that could have happened. Um, Connell, is it possible that there were different versions of the study oh, at the time, and that maybe in the '60s and early '70s? There were different iterations of this. Uh, of course, there. Abs- I'm, I'm sure there were. Okay. Um, the the only one I've been able to document, with, like I said, with receipts, has been the, the Ford McBride study. Um, but uh, and and this doesn't even sound like it was a study that Ray was participating in. If this was just run of the mill therapy that they were doing with whatever student happened to come in. Um, so. That, and that's a whole other thing then. <clears throat> um, and another reaction I have, I, I want to slap Ray for participating in this. And uh, there's almost a little smirkiness about him <laughs> in, in describing his participation. It, it, I'm just like, wow, you, you saw all this horrible stuff going on and you kept up going with it that that makes me angry um yeah so the 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 only person that i have actually talked to about i the only the only person i was able to find who participated in ford mcbride study was a man named john uh who uh, participated and then later on he wrote a play about it called 14 because that's the number of subjects in in the experiment but um it and it just you know, it messed him up horribly, but um, I did meet a lesbian once years and years and years ago, and she said she had gone through aversive conditioning at BYU in in the mid seventies. And that's the only woman that I know of that had had claimed that, that that happened. And I think that's probably a really great topic too, because we don't talk much about the the women's side of it. We often think that this is just um, a male driven uh, therapy program, but well, um, it's, I, it's, it's a patriarchy. Women don't count. You know? <laughs> Sorry, I'm being flippant. Okay, so now now we're even. The bald joke and <laughs> Connell, I I have a question. I I remember talking to Carolyn Pearson about the electroshock therapy, and her I believe I remember her reporting to me that that she had she had heard accounts of some of these participants uh, eventually uh, in these electroshock therapy studies dying by suicide it, yeah, it, that's that- in her that's in her book goodbye i love you she she, she talks about that yeah yeah so, so one of the reasons why we may not have living people to to tell the stories is because they're no longer alive right well, yeah, and behind the scenes, Connell and I have discussed this, the advent of affirmation, which he opened the this episode with, um, the history behind the, the beginning of affirmation started with the apparent suicide of two men. Um, and then Robert McQueen, his uh, uh, history in this space said that there were five men that, that had completed suicide um, as a result of this. So there's seven there. Um, I, I wish we had more of those receipts. I wish we knew more of the stories um, of those who who did take their lives during this period, which again, I think we need to um, make absolute clear uh, with clarity. This was during the time President Oaks was the president of BYU. And, and I think it begs the question, if there were seven suicides that took place uh, at BYU as a result of some of these treatments, that wouldn't be newsworthy, right? I mean, someone should be paying attention to five 
or seven suicides, I would think. Yeah. But I mean, so suicide is such a taboo topic, especially back then. We're, we're getting more comfortable talking about it and admitting it. But, you know, back then, if someone committed suicide, it was not in the obituary. It may, it may not even actually be, well, I'm not sure about the legality of a doctor lying on a death certificate. But, you know, the, to make the family feel comfortable, people did whatever was necessary so that you weren't embarrassed by... And I think that is a good point because um, I discussed this with the president of Affirmation, Nathan Kitchen, yesterday, and he brought up a really great point about um, the visibility of these names. This topic was so taboo and it was so there was such a level of ostracism around this topic that few people even used their real names in discussing um, a lot of their experiences. They they I mean, that that's maybe a testament to where we're at today. We're finally able to to be really open and out in public and discuss these, these topics with real names, with real people, with real lived experiences, because that wasn't something that existed. And I've noticed in the chat, um, in our, our Facebook and our YouTube chat, uh, in this particular um, event, how many people were talking about the 1970s era where the church was creating secret surveillance programs. They were using uh, the law enforcement um, to root out homosexuals everywhere, campus cops, uh, the BYU honor code that we want to get to and, and discuss a little bit. But there were so many ways the church was trying to root out gay people that it just wasn't safe to come out at all. Yeah. And the way the church was also talking about the subject publicly, and well, at, at least at, at BYU and sometimes in general conference, you know, um, uh, it, it, I think it, it is hard, you know, uh, because uh, something that uh, Dr. Eugene Thorne talks about on, on on the podcast is that during during that time there was so much um, polarization on the subject of homosexuality, and not many people, especially conservative people, did not agree with uh, it having been removed from the DSM um as a pathology so they still like and because he was there for so long like they still have those beliefs that it was something that had to be cured but there is a question that like if it's the the universe the lord's university guided by someone who was going to be the an apostle and why why was this not seen you know like and and known and 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 prevented i think it's a great point i was just going to add i was so disturbed to learn that <clears throat> that basically they would they would see if they could catch a byu student who was gay or lesbian uh behaving inappropriately that that when they'd be reported to the honor code officer to bishops or whatever that the that the bishops and or you know, BYU leaders would basically say, you need to go to this therapy um, or you'll be kicked out of the university. So basically people were channeled to the study from church leaders and they were channeled to the study under threat of being kicked out of the university. That's yeah. a sort of coercion uh, that, that feels really, you know, it's coercion into a program where you have to sign a consent form acknowledging that you could have organ damage or tissue damage as a result of the study, the ethics of that are triply troubling yeah. um, it, given that people were coerced, coerced and kind of forced into the study under threat of being kicked out of the university. I had a active Latter-day Saint who really tried to push back on what we've just been discussing over the last few minutes saying there is no evidence that these uh, secret, secret surveillance programs existed. There's no documentation. This is all hy hypothetical and speculative. And uh, I just pointed them to chapter six of the miracle of forgiveness. Uh, Spencer Kimball outlines or uh, puts it right in words in chapter six, um, the, the uh, underground um, systems that they were creating to root out um, via surveillance uh, gay people. And, it, and the other point that I wanted to bring up too, uh, that we started with, it wasn't just men, but it was women as well. I interviewed Judith Mayer, 
who is uh, a, an artist who painted some of Mormonism's most iconic art uh, in the gospel library kit. She's a lesbian. She was a lesbian when she attended BYU, closeted, obviously, um, in the 60s and 70s. But she was hired um, to spy on lesbian women or people that they, they, they thought. So she was an RA. Um, they hired her to spy on, on lesbian women, purported lesbian women, and then report that back to uh, uh, President Dye, Gerald Dye, uh, in this university, uh, university administration office. Um, or what would eventually become the honor code office. So I, I think this is an um, interesting space where it's it's well documented, just also well hidden and try, uh, I, maybe the church is again, pulling an Elder Oaks and trying to do their very, very best at throwing this all away. Uh, there, there's all, there is also, I, I have on my website, uh, the, the, the LGBT history of Mormonism um, that I've put up there. Um, there was a, a class at BYU. It was just a justice administration, and there was a number that went along with it. You could get credit for doing spy work against LGBT BYU students, and one of the, one of these men uh, took advantage of that. Uh, and he started entrapping uh, people who were who were attending affirmation, who were BYU students. He put in he put in an ad in the paper saying, "Oh, I'm a gay Mormon, and um, I I really need help. Some you know, please contact me." And so these unsuspecting men would go ahead and and contact him, um, and uh, and and he got credit for it. Did this he got university credit for 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 doing this spy work we've got a we've we've got got a your website the address to your website we've got a visual of it it's connell and uh slash lgbt mormons dot html yeah it's it's called the abominable and detestable crime against nature a revised history of homosexuality and mormonism 1840 to 1980 and we'll add that to the show notes yeah. yeah, incredible. Maybe uh, should we spend the next couple of minutes? In, well, all right, let's uh, electroshock therapy. Anything that we we didn't talk about um, that we should have brought up in this topic, in, especially in relation to uh, President Oaks's statement that this was completely disabandoned prior to him taking over as president. No, I can't think of anything else. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, there's one just. Uh, one thing about Gerald Dye, um, so he was named by Dowling Oaks as the head of what is now called the Honor Code Office. Um, he was uh, he, he was called back then in the University Standards Office, and he he was the head of it from nine, 1971 to nineteen eighty, placed put in place by by Elder Oaks, and then when Elder Oaks uh, stop being the president of the university. He stopped being head of it, and he's on record on, um, on, and he's quoted on a book stating that electroshock therapy um, happened at BYU during his time as uh, the head of the honor code office uh, in some homosexual in some cases of homosexuality. I just wanted to bring that up. Let's talk a little bit about the um, the players at, at the table. We haven't talked much about Robert Card, um, who has been disaffectionately known as the shock father, who had a wild history at BYU. And then some of the other uh, psychologists um, that also played a part in um, pushing the the narrative. I'm not saying the uh, electric shock therapy portion of this, but the narrative behind change therapy or mixed orientation marriages or um, the Spencer Kimball method of bloody knuckles, calloused knees, bruised forehead methods of solving homosexuality within Mormonism. So we have Dr. Robert Card, um, Dr. Alan Bergen, Dr. Lindsay Curtis. Um, we've talked about Dr. Thorne, um, Victor L. Brown, who is the uh, presiding bishop. Ma uh, Dean Bird uh, is another name we haven't discussed much. 
what do we know about these these gentlemen? Uh, what insights can you add, Connell, to um, some of those names within this space? I, 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 so I focused mainly up to 1980 on my, my, my queer history of Mormonism. So I don't know much about what ha happened later. Uh, and then as far as Dr. Alan Bergen, who, who was at BYU, um, I have since befriended him. Uh, he had a gay son who, who died, who had been a, um, an email friend of mine. And um, he, Bergen's son was really traumatized by his father's role and what had happened at BYU in the uh, mid seventies and into the eighties. And since, since his, his son's death, Alan Bergen has made a complete turnabout and has formally apologized for his role in anything that he's done to hurt the LGBT community. And he is fully, fully supportive of us now. And I just want to acknowledge that, you know, and he's, he's getting older now and, and is having health issues. But um, I, I was, I, I was so grateful to get to meet with him. I held a lot of anger against him for many years. Uh, and um, so it was good to let go of that and, and know that he had come around and, and is woke, as we say. So I, I just wanted to put that out there. I think that's important because the, the Bergen family um, has a lot of history in this space. And yeah. And Alan was quite influential. He left Columbia, Univers Columbia University to work at BYU and not specific to the um, LGBTQ issues, um, but they were the events of the time. And then surrounding um, Dean Bird, Robert Card, Curtis Brown, I mean, all of these uh, big names that were that were uh, championing or her heralding this new method of of uh, conversion or aversion therapies. It was easy to get caught up in that. And it was on the Latter Gay Stories podcast uh, through um, through our podcast that Alan Bergen made that official apology. Oh. And it, it was one of the most touching things I had read in this space because for so many queer Latter-day Saints, they only want an apology. They are looking for the church to become accountable for uh, the treatments, the electric shock therapies, the aversion therapies, the, the therapies that happen in stake and bishop uh, bishop's offices and stake president's offices over those tables in those personal interviews. So many are just looking for an apology and then moving from those spaces into um, better understanding. But the Bergen apology, I think was, was fantastic. And you can read that if you haven't read that yet, it's also in on the record. Um, and it's just, it's just beautiful and kind. And it's the approach that more Latter-day Saint leaders need to take in, in this, uh, Topic. So I thank you, uh, Connell. Sure. Um, not in uh, specifically speaking on behalf of the Bergen family, but I think they would appreciate that that message there that yeah. you gave. I think that was sweet. And I keep thinking, what Oaks could have done, the power that he had to do something really positive when he was asked that question, and he could have said, you know, stuff went on. I'm embarrassed, I'm, in sh I'm ashamed of it. Or, or even if he really honestly didn't know that it was happening during his administration, still to apologize and say, I, I don't know that it did, I don't think it did. If it did, I'm really sorry. You know, that we've, I've, I've come a long way, the church has come a long way. Um, it, it could have been a really super powerful moment of healing and growth and, and progress, but you know, it just, that, that we have to have this damn podcast here to talk about him lying about it. Just, oh, it, it's really aggravating. And I think that's exactly why we, we're having this discussion. Um, and, and it's the problem. We had an Oaks who gave, in my opinion, um, a cons kind of a conciliatory speech. He was able to rally around that message that you just talked about, Connell, maybe putting laying down our weapons of war and some of these uh, battles that are 
not worth winning or fighting and coalescing behind a common message that that there are real people behind this topic. And I thought his University of Virginia speech had the ability to do that because there were some really decent um, conciliatory messages in there. There were other things that I, um, as a as a gay person, wasn't in love with either. But that that I suppose is the politics of the message. But then when the leaked audio comes out and you you listen to what he was talking about before this speech, I think that's what makes this this episode so damning. And I couldn't agree more. What an oppor- what a lost opportunity for Mormonism. What a lost opportunity for President Oaks, who has the stain of these ele- uh, electroshock therapies on his hands as president of BYU, to not look at that and say, wow, we have a tough history in this space. And we have done so much better. We haven't done good enough. I mean, there's a variety of apologies that could have taken place. Um, but it was a missed opportunity. Uh, it, w- it was actually, a, it was a, a terrible way of rolling that out. Uh, thoughts, uh, John or Gerardo? Um, I, well, I completely agree with you, Kyle. Um, it, it, I think it's just, it, it, instead of helping or even just being neutral, it adds to the hurt and, and the, uh, you, you know, the, damage that the church has done in in many of many people like us in our lives you know like i i went through conversion therapy uh, i connell did as well and just this that the fact that the church doesn't want to reckon or that the church doesn't want to recognize its error that uh elder oaks had the chance to to give an apology or or like even connell said just admit that he didn't know about it, say that he didn't know about it, just take a different position. He just decides to be de- defensive about it, uh, say that he didn't have anything to do with it or like that it didn't even happen uh, when we know it did. And so it just adds to the hurt of of many of us. And that, I was just trying to pull that up as you were speaking because I wanted to get, um, and I wanted to let the audience um, hear what he said. <clears throat> because we know, I mean, we know the leaked audio um, and media outlets all over. I just got a notification today that um, uh, a newspaper in LA just picked it up as well. Um, mm-hmm. But I just wanted to read what the church spokesman said um, because Oaks didn't address it completely. This is uh, this is after the, the Tribune. Yeah, reached out to the, to the church and and was and asked uh, for a, for a comment because uh, for the article they were going to write. Did you post this on your Facebook page, Kyle? Yeah, I, I did, and I just found it here. Oaks. So uh, this is Doug Anderson, uh, church public spokesman. Um, Oaks says um, the Oaks declines to comment on the discrepancy between his memory and the research. Uh, then Doug Anderson pointed to the 2016 public statement um, saying either um, there, the, see, the church denounces any therapy, including conversion and reparative therapies the, that subjects an individual to abusive practices, not only in Utah, but throughout the world. Just a standard uh, statement from the 2006 um, uh, conversion therapy discussion that the church had released. But to me, I mean, that's just amazing. The, the message was... Um, he he declines to comment on this discrepancy between his memory and the research. So disingenuous, like Connell brought up, I think this is another missed opportunity. Not only if, if in the heat of the moment in Virginia, he doesn't understand the question, he answers it the wrong way. Here was an opportunity to redeem himself and to explain exactly after resting and having a, a refresh and a reset. And he doubles down again and he says, um, there's a discrepancy perhaps between memory and research, but uh, we affirm that it, it didn't exist. Unbelievable, in my opinion. Yeah, there's yeah. really no excuse for a lack of apology there, given how many people were hurt um, and the evidence that's so clear. Yeah. But because Elder Oaks is on record as saying, we neither seek no give, nor give apologies, he's he's acting consistently with his with his his public position which is that if you're a apostle 
in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you do not ever apologize. I don't know how we make uh, progress in this space. Uh, I don't know how the Mormon Church makes progress in this space uh, under those terms. It, it's, uh, it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult road to hoe. Uh, any final thoughts? What haven't we talked about that we should have talked about? Any other things you wanted to add, Connell, to the electroshock experience? Um, and, and where do we go from here? Where does Mormonism go from here, in your opinion? I'm a non-believer, so I, it's, uh, to me, it's irrelevant. Sorry. <laughs> but I think it's relevant to the audience, to the LGBTQ audience, um, because the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, especially in Utah, has such a such a hold, not only at a legislative level, but uh, a public level uh, within an ecumenical uh, church and, and at home. How, how do we make progress in this space with such a monster who is um, unwilling uh, to deviate from the, the message? I, I think, um, you know, it's hard because uh, as, as you were talking right now, Kyle, it just reminds me that there, there, there might be uh, LGBTQ youth in the audience who is who are listening to us. You know, who are still trying to figure out where they stand in their beliefs with the church. Uh, the way we have been conditioned uh, from many of us from birth to believe in the church and 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 uh, our families taking us to church and teaching us. Uh, what the church teaches, those, those are really hard things to uh, deprogram ourselves and, and detach ourselves from, from the way we've been conditioned to think about ourselves, about our identity. Um, the church has made a little bit of progress uh, by trying to focus more on, on the divine identity of individuals teaching, trying to teach LGBT youth that they are sons and daughters of God, and that's what they should be concentrating on. Um, but it goes both ways, because that could be used as a weapon, because the church gets to describe what that means and what, what, and what that's supposed to lead people to do. Um, and while there are so many advocates out there uh, who are still members of the church, but they want to see more progress. Um, I think it, we all have to consider the implications of, of everything that we're advocating for. So if we are out there advocating for uh, staying in the church or the church uh, making progress, we need to see how the church is using its rhetoric to either control or hurt or damage some LGBT, uh, LGBT members. I like it. John, um, clinically, uh, closing thoughts on uh, what impact does this have on a community when the sometimes I I hate saying this, but sometimes it's the abuser when when the abuser continues to abuse and, and to talk in terms of the abuser and the abused. How do we rise above this and how, how do we take statements that are patently false, just blatantly false and still try to support a community that's marginalized. I mean, I think they say sometimes that sunlight is the best disinfectant and I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful that this happened because one of the, one of the most damaging teachings within Mormonism is that, you know, the, the prophet seers and revelators speak for God and that they're the most honest and honor, honorable men in the church. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, I I forget things all the time. My memory's bad. It, this the point here isn't to jump on a ninety year old man or an eighty nine year old man and say no one can ever forget anything and let's pick on an old old guy who forgot something. I don't think that's what we're doing, and it's not even to sort of just find an excuse to pick apart the church leaders. But if I'm thinking about these LGBT youth. And it's somewhere between five per, five to ten percent of more active Mormon youth right now fit somewhere along the LGBTQ spectrum. What this what this story helps to do is to give us some very clear ammo where we now have Elder Oaks publicly denying something 
basically that that this that this research happened while he was president and we know that it happened right smack dab in the middle of his administration and if we can spread the word about this um this story which we're doing here um it can help active mormon parents teach their children if they're willing um or have their their children find out their lgbtq children find out if their parents or the church aren't willing to tell them that they should take what mormon apostles prophets seers and revelators say with a grain of salt um, that they don't have to believe everything they teach that sometimes they make mistakes and sometimes they even publicly lie um and hopefully that the, the sunlight and the transparency thanks to Connell O'Donovan being willing to come on, thanks to you, Kyle, being willing to cover this. Um, because of because we're covering this, it's going to help maybe some LGBTQ youth, just Mormon youth, realize that they don't have to always believe and follow. And then, and then from that, hopefully parents can be more affirming to the – Mormon parents can be more affirming to their, their LGBTQ youth, and they can start directing their LGBTQ youth – to places like in circle where uh, they're going to find an, an affirming environment that's supportive and they can get the support they need. Ultimately, I think the number one cause of, uh, you know, suicidal ideation and or death by suicide within Mormonism is parental or familial rejection. That's what the, um, that's what Caitlin Ryan and the Family and Acceptance Project has shown. And so if we can get more and more and more believing Mormon parents, and this is what you do so well, Kyle, if, if more and more believing uh, Mormon parents, again, can understand that these leaders make big mistakes sometimes, and if they can inoculate their LGBTQ believing Mormon youth against thinking of these leaders as speaking for God, I think that's where where the most positivity is going to come. Um, parents, Mormon parents, believing and embracing and celebrating their LGBTQ youth, and uh, all Mormon believers uh, learning to to um, downgrade the teachings of Mormon prophets, seers, and revelators from the Word of God to the opinions of men that sometimes are are just not true, factually untrue. Well, I think that is the great divide that's happened in this space is we have went from a culture of believing exactly what you just talked about of policy and pulpit to people and personal revelation. And as we focus more on the person and the real lived experiences of the LGBTQ community, that's where we start seeing the progress. And and I think very bluntly, that's also where we start seeing the disaffection, where a parent can look at their gay son or daughter and say, uh, he or she or they are none of the things that the prophets and apostles told us about these people in this particular topic. And that's where this great divide has happened. And that's where the change will happen as well, in my opinion. Uh, but, but we can't do it without great um, uh, people, stories, individual experiences. Um, like we've shared today, the decades of research that Connell has added into this space, um, which I, I think is absolutely invaluable. Um, and, and just to just a nod to you, Connell, uh, as a closeted gay Latter-day Saint who was all in 100% trying to do everything possible, I fell into your research. And I, I studied so much of what you wrote and, and I tried to quarrel and just and studied so much of what you were able to accumulate. And um, I was just trying to put all those pieces together because I was none of the things that the church leaders talked about. I was not a contagion. I didn't feel like a disease. I didn't feel like a, a sinner next to um, a murderer. I didn't, I didn't feel like any of those things. Um, and, and it was because of the good that you did in this space in highlighting exactly that I think John just was so eloquently displayed. Uh, it made a difference for me um, and, it, and it changed my world. And in a very real effect um, has given me a platform to try to help other queer Latter-day Saints in or, or not even just Latter-day Saints, just other LGBTQ people in navigating this space in a much more healthy way um, with or without Mormonism. I just want people to know that they're not alone, they're not broken, and that there are solid and wonderful days ahead. But I, I wanted to thank you, Connell, um, oh, for doing that you, for me. Kyle. Thank you very much. That 
that just makes my day. Um, we're not broken. Electric shock therapy was about fixing our brokenness. And we weren't broken to begin with. And instead, they took these beautiful people and broke them. And, you know, it's just, it's horrific. But, you know, for, my message will always be love. Always. Love, 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 love. And if you stray from that, then you, you're, you're on the wrong path. And, um, yeah, shock therapy is not about love. There was nothing loving about that. Um, and so if, if you're LGBTIQA plus youth who is in Mormonism uh, in the LDS church, struggling, just remember to love yourself. You're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. There's, uh, the, ch the church is broken by promoting these messages of our brokenness. That just proves that the church itself is broken. And um, so don't give up. I'm here. I'm here for the long haul. The LGBTQ uh, community was worth the investment. And uh, I, I think just the smiling faces, the happy experiences, and the progress they make um, are evidences of everything that you just spoke of. So thank you, Connell. Thank you, Gerardo and John, for um, your great work in this space. And we can't do it without you, um, the listeners and supporters of podcasts like Mormon Stories and Latter-day Stories. Uh, we absolutely run off of um, off of your spirit, your strength, your dedication to uh, lifting the the marginalized, but also um, to make informed uh, decisions based on uh, informed consent. And and as John talked about, bringing so much of this out into the sunlight. And I know for for both podcasts, on behalf of Latter Gay Stories and uh, Mormon Stories, uh, we appreciate um, all of the. Uh, the individual support, both financial and, and physical and emotional support that, that goes into uh, producing episodes like this and, and content like this that helps us to, to bring to pass that very message that Connell talked about, that uh, especially within queer spaces, that there is no brokenness um, in particular to the individual um, uh, LGBTQ person. So thank you. And, and John, maybe we'll just end this by... Um, how how can our latter gay stories listeners and those who are catching us on Mormon stories support the Mormon stories um, podcast and and some of the efforts that you're doing? Uh, I'm just I you know I'm I'm happy for this episode just to echo your your thanks to uh, Connell O'Donovan Connell. I've referenced your your uh, research over the years, and it has you know we would not be where we are without you. We whenever we do anything these days we we stand on the shoulders of giants and you're you're one of maybe nowadays uh amongst the younger populations your name isn't uh maybe as well known it's certainly not as well known as it should be and i'm just really grateful uh that i that i along with kyle and gerardo were able to play a small part of of uh, alerting the younger generations to your monumental work. And we will be including links in our show notes uh, so that people can become more familiar with your groundbreaking work and uh, hopefully give you some of the attention and the credit that you deserve for, for what you've given us all. So thank you, Connell. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. I, I should note, I do not have control over that website any longer. I lost the password to it uh, 10 years ago. I have not been able to update it. Some of the links are broken. So I apologize for that. I wish I could figure out a way to migrate it to a different server and make sure that it was once again complete and working fully. But do you, do you, do you have control of the domain name? Connell? Yes. Yeah, that's I do pay for that. I could I could help you do that okay. uh, someday Thank if you. you want if you wanted that. I could help. Yes. 
I just wanted to end on a note from the Bergen family. Um, Marion, uh, which is Alan Bergen's wife, just uh, jumped into the chat. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're doing great work. Um, and she thanks us for the kind words uh, for Alan Bergen. And again, I just wanted to give another plug for On the Record because uh, that's where Alan Bergen posted that apology uh, concerning his time from uh, spent at BYU. Um, it's just profound. And, and in my opinion, just one of the most beautiful things I've read in terms of an apology in this space. So thank you again to the Bergen family. Uh, thanks to the audience. We've had a, a, a robust audience throughout uh, this, this whole few hours of this event. We thank you for your participation. Uh, we thank you for uh, the comments that you've made. We've we paid attention to these as we kind of went through the discussion and tried to answer a lot of those questions. But let's continue to have a discussion about this. Share, an ep share episodes like this. Share this particular episode. I think it's super important within uh, the realm of Mormonism, those who are, are seriously trying to, to better understand uh, the details of this space. We absolutely know for a fact that during President Oaks's uh, time as president of BYU, electroshock therapy uh, not only existed, uh, but in its own right was thriving. And we have, uh, we have that evidence. And it's just unfortunate that there was a missed opportunity for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to clean that slate the best they could, um, follow that repentance process and, and allow a greater light uh, to shine in to these spaces. Gentlemen, again, thank you for your participation. Again, thank you to those who have participated in this chat and uh, continue to follow content like this on the, the uh, Mormon Stories uh, site, which we thank for this opportunity to, to do a collaboration with uh, and with Latter Gay Stories as well. Uh, we, we each have YouTube, um, Facebook pages, and uh, audio podcast channels that you can find more content just like this. But again, thank you to uh, each of you for participating, and we'll look forward to another Latter Gay and Mormon story episode in the future. Thanks, everybody.